Okay, good morning. So my uh, the philosophy of mind lecture this week, this week only, is going to be online rather than in person. Unfortunately, I'm terrible with technology, so I spent an hour yesterday thinking I was recording it, only to find I was actually talking to myself. So I thought today the safest thing I can do is just to do something I know definitely works, I know how to do, which is live stream it on my YouTube channel. So that's what I'm going to do. And then I thought, the more I thought about it, that it might be interesting for subscribers to this channel and students from Durham University to interact, perhaps in the comments, pioneering some innovative forms of teaching here at Durham. Please be polite. Um, okay, anyway, a one-off. We'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes next week. We'll be back to being in person, and um, but also next week I'll set aside some time for my students in my office to discuss the lecture material to compensate for the interaction we would usually have in a live lecture. Um, if somebody could, uh, yeah, we are live. Okay, so so you've had five weeks so far with Professor Gibb going in depth into dualism and the causal closure problem for dualism. In many ways, this first term on theories of consciousness, you can think of as an attempt to find out which theory has the least worst problem. Maybe it's a bit like uh, Churchill famously said about democracy. It's the worst system of government apart from all the others, right? I sometimes think many people will defend their favored theory of consciousness and say, it's an absolutely terrible theory. It's got huge problems, but it's the problems are less bad than all the others. So with dualism, you've got the causal closure problem, which you've looked at in great detail. We're now going to look at two other theories of consciousness with me for the second half of the term for the next five weeks, physicalism and panpsychism. With physicalism, we'll look at the problems posed by the knowledge argument and the zombie argument. And uh, now panpsychism, when we get onto that, presents itself as solving both the causal closure problem of dualism and the um, knowledge argument, zombie argument problems of physicalism. Unfortunately, it also faces a big problem, namely the combination problem. So, so your job really is to work out what you think of these problems, maybe. Um, Maybe you think one or more of them aren't really problems, or maybe they're all problems, but some are less bad than others. Uh, and that can shape how you decide the theory you're going to defend in um, an essay or the exam at the end of the year. Okay. So, so for the next two weeks or so, we're going to be looking at these challenges to uh, physicalism. All right, so let's, I always like to start, I think good philosophy should start with how we're defining words, hopefully not end with how we're defining words, but we want to get clear on the subject matter, so get some clear, precise definitions. Um, so physicalism, materialism, you've already been talking about with Sophie, defined as the view that mental properties are either identical with or dependent on physical properties. So the reductive physicalist position is that my feeling of pain just is identical with a certain pattern of neural firings, just as water just is identical with H2O. The non-reductive physicalist rejects that kind of very that kind of very specific identity of a particular feeling with a particular neurophysiological state. Nonetheless, as physicalists, they hold that my feelings and my experiences and all of my mental properties are wholly dependent on the patterns of electrochemical activity in my brain. But here's a question you might not have considered thus far is, well, what does the word physical in that definition actually mean? It's a funny one. It's one of those words that you sort of think you know what it means. And then when you stop and uh, reflect for a minute, it's, it's, a, it's not all obvious what it does mean. It's a little bit like perhaps St. Augustine said about time. Everyone knows what time is until you think about it for a moment. They think, what the hell is time? So maybe it's a bit like that. Now, there is a huge literature on this, which I consider, for example, in my the second chapter of my academic book, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality. 
which you can get on the university system. And it's just coming out in paperback. Actually, I think it's just come out in paperback. Um, and this is something you might want to dig into in your own independent research. Um, but given limited time, I don't want to get too bogged down on uh, how we define words. So I'm just going to suggest a definition of physicalism, the one I work with in uh, my book, Galileo's Error, that you're welcome to just adopt unless you would unless you want to dig into this and maybe uh, argue for a different definition of physicalism. Okay, but the definition, the default definition we're going to use here is that physical, um, the physical is defined as what can be captured in the purely quantitative language of physics. What do I mean by purely quantitative? I mean involving only mathematical and causal concepts. Um, so since Galileo, as I talk about in Galileo's era, physics, this was Galileo's big decision that physics was going to be what he called natural philosophy, what we now call physics, was just going to be pretty much a bunch of mathematics. Um, but it's arguably physical science, at least more generally, is not purely mathematical. Um, in neuroscience and in chemistry, we have causal notions or think, I mean, things like mass and charge are defined causally in terms of what they do, gravitational attraction, resistance to acceleration. It's more controversial whether there is causation in fundamental physics, but at least there is the notion of a law of nature. And this is a not a mathematical notion. It's perhaps a causal notion or, or perhaps what we call a gnomic or nomological notion. We're going to come to this term in very shortly. This means to do with laws of nature. Okay, so anyway, physics has this quite constrained vocabulary, physical science, purely quantitative, only mathematical and causal concepts. So we can define the physical as what can be articulated in those terms. And I think that works well, actually, with the arguments we're going to consider. So it's important perhaps to know that these arguments we're about to look at, what they're trying to do is that they're trying to argue that the truth of physicalism is incompatible with the reality of consciousness. Perhaps in something like the way certain arguments from evil and suffering against the existence of God try to argue that the existence of evil and suffering or the particular kinds of evil and suffering we find are incompatible with the existence of God. God, um, And because we know that evil and suffering exists, we can infer that God does not exist. At least that's what happens in the stronger forms of the, that argument known as the logical problem of evil or logical argument from evil. So similarly, anti-physicalists are trying to argue that the truth of physicalism is incompatible with the reality of consciousness. We know consciousness exists, therefore physicalism must be false. I think it's important to point that out that because these are trying to be arguments from a from a data point they're trying to draw out what they take to be the implications of that data point namely the reality of consciousness this real arguably real phenomenon we are acquainted with of our own feelings and experiences um now that doesn't mean the arguments work of course many physicalists will reject the first premise maybe some physicalists reject the second premise but it's just to make the point that it is not supposed to be uh, a sort of abstract philosophical argument. It's supposed to be an appeal to data and drawing out the implications of um, the data point that a certain phenomenon exists. OK, doesn't mean the argument works, but it's important to understand how the argument is attempting to work. All right, so let's get more into specifics. What I'm going to do this lecture is present the knowledge argument and the zombie argument as I formulate them in Galileo's error, which is the um, course reading for the next couple of weeks. Um, but that is a book aimed at a general audience. I hope it's a good introduction to, to these arguments and to get you initially thinking about them, to shape discussion in your seminar discussion groups. Um, but ultimately, we want to get more into the details of the um, academic 
presentation and discussion of these arguments, <coughs> which is hinted at in footnotes in Galileo's era, but which is more fully worked out in, for example, my academic book, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality, also in um, obviously many, many other works by anti-physicalists like David Chalmers, also the response from various physicalists that we will explore. So this week we'll look at the more accessible formulation of the argument, and then next week we'll dig a bit deeper. Um, if so, someone want to quickly comment that that I am live, just so I know I'm not talking to myself. Um, okay, so let's get more specific. Let's start with the knowledge argument. This is formulated by the Australian philosopher Frank Jackson, um, who is a wonderful philosopher, also a very nice person. I had the fortune of uh, interacting with him a lot when I was a postdoc at the Australian National University where he works. If people don't know what a postdoc is, it's if you, when you finish your PhD before you get a teaching job. So if you're lucky enough, you can have a job for a year or two where you um, just are able to focus on writing and trying to get some things published. Um, so Frank Jackson uh, formulated this argument in the 80s. Now, what is interesting, although this is one of the most discussed challenges to physicalism in contemporary philosophy, um, Jackson actually ultimately changed his mind on it in the 1990s and is now a quite radical kind of physicalist, amazingly. Um, so anyway, that doesn't mean the argument doesn't work. Doesn't mean it does work, but it's a little interesting tidbit. Uh, okay, so the nice thing about this argument is that it begins with a story. So if you're sitting comfortably, I will tell that story. It's the tale of black and white Mary. Um, just let me know if we are live, if, 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 if someone gets a chance. Okay. So here's the setup. Mary is a genius neuroscientist. She's, in fact, she's so brilliant. Her expertise is in color experience and she's so brilliant. She knows everything neuroscience has to teach us about what goes on in the um, in the brain when we experience colors. So when particular wavelengths of light hit the eyes, how they make changes in the brain, how that leads to various information processing, um, and how that ultimately results in certain kinds of behavior. She knows all that stuff. Oh, Alistair Boyers just said, you are live. Thank you very much, Alistair. Um, I'm not talking to myself, sorry, just so frustrating that I talked to myself for an hour yesterday. <laughs> okay, um, so so she's this absolute genius, and she's got, maybe it's said in the future, she's got the complete final story neuroscience has to tell us about the um, neuroscience of color experience. But for some reason that is never explained, She's raised in a black and white room. So Mary has only ever seen black and white and shades of gray. Okay. Now there are all sorts of issues one might have about the plausibility of this story. Has Mary never bled and seen her own blood? Uh, her own blood? Her own blood. Um, the idea is she's learned physics from a black and white television and black and white books. But... There are all sorts of understandable troubles my one might have about this. This is why I'm one thing I suggest in Galileo's era is actually the story. You don't need such a far-fetched story, perhaps. And I talk about the case of the, the late uh, Scandinavian color scientist, Nut Norby, who had cones missing from his eyes and so was, as a result, only able to see black and white and shades of gray. Maybe the closest we've had to a uh, real-life Murray. And Nut Norby was interested in philosophy and these philosophical discussions. So he wrote on what it was like um, for him thinking about these questions as something like a real life Mary. And you can you can look at that in Galileo's era. Okay, but this this is not the end of the story. Um the, there's a twist, right? The climax of the story. Again, it's not explained why, but Mary is liberated from her black and white prison. The door is flung open 
And Mary sees, let's say, on the threshold, a bright red rose on the threshold of her prison. She escapes into the world around us with all the beautiful colours and has all these wonderful new experiences. And then the thought is, the thought is of the proponent of this argument, not only does she have these new colour experiences, but as she have has them, and in having them, she learns something new. Mary gains some new knowledge. What is that knowledge? It's allegedly what it's like to see red. What Mary learns is what it's like to see red. The thought is, despite all she knew about from her brain science and neuro neurophysiological studies, that information couldn't teach us what it's like to see red, the qualitative character of a red experience. This is what she discovers only when she actually experiences color. All right, that's the story. Now, I've taught this argument for nearly 20 years now. And I've discovered that many people get the argument a bit wrong. I don't know whether it's maybe because it's a kind of catchy story and you think, oh, I get it. I get the story. Um, but it's always important in philosophy. And this is one of the things you're being <coughs> graded on is that you get not just the gist, but the details of the argument. Right. I recently debated the um, physicist Sean Carroll. You can look at that on YouTube, also on this channel, actually. And um, I, I said to gasps from the audience. He wouldn't get a good grade on my course because he misunderstood the knowledge argument. Um, but, I mean, to be fair, Sean is, um, like certain scientists I won't mention, it, it is pretty clued up on philosophy and has um, takes philosophy very seriously. But this is actually just a, a very common issue. So what people, what people often think is that people often think the argument's supposed to be this. Mary learned all this neuroscience and yet she still couldn't experience red. If materialism were true, surely reading the neuroscience would allow you to experience red. Now, that would be a terrible argument, right? Of course, of course, not Nolby is not going to experience red, uh, you know, just from reading neuroscience. You know, he's got the cones missing in his eyes. But the ability to experience red depends on what's going on in your brain. It's only when Mary leaves the room, the light hits her eyes, it makes the brain that's when she experienced red. of course everyone agrees on that right that's that is not the challenge nobody disputes that you know it's no reason to think a materialist would be committed to reading neuroscience lets you experience color you know why would you think that right that that's that's not the argument whether you can experience color depends as everybody agrees on what's going on in your brain that's not the argument. This is the argument, right? The clue is in the title, knowledge argument, right? The point is, the claim of proponents of this argument is not just that Mary only has experiences when she leaves the room, but that she gains new knowledge, new information. She learns something new. Why is that important? Well, because if According to physicalism, maybe you dispute this, but this is the thought. According to physicalism, neuroscience gives you, or maybe physical science more generally, gives you the complete metaphysical story of what's going on in the brain when you see color. That's it. That's the full story. That is all the information you can get. And so it shouldn't be possible for Mary to learn something new. Yes, she'll have an experience the first time, but that shouldn't give her some new information, new knowledge, because according to physicalism, she already had all the information. So the analogy I give in Galileo's error is, um, you know, suppose you, have, suppose you take yourself to have the final theory of black holes. Well, if you've got the final theory of black holes, it shouldn't be possible for you to go on and learn some new essential feature of black holes. If you do go on and learn some new essential feature of black holes, that shows you didn't really have the complete theory to start off with, right? 
Similarly, if Murray um, had the complete story of color experience, all the information from the neuroscience, she shouldn't be able to learn any anything new. That's the thought. She shouldn't be able to learn some new um, essential feature of color experiences. But the thought is that she does. What is the new uh, information she learns? Uh, well, let, let, let's so, so let, let's give the argument in a sort of in premise premise conclusion form. So this is the way I lay it out in Galileo's error. There might be different ways of laying it out. You might want to look at the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on the knowledge argument as well. This is very good. Okay, so premise one. Oh, sorry, the slides got a bit messed up by the software there. I don't know why that's happened. Premise one. I hope it's still legible. If physicalism is true, then Mary in her black and white room has a complete and final theory of color experience. Premise two, if Mary in her black and white room has a complete and final theory of color experience, uh, then it isn't possible for her to learn about some new essential features of color experiences. She, re she And yet, premise three, when Mary leaves her room, she does learn so about some new essential feature of color experiences. She learns what it's like to see colors. Conclusion, therefore, Mary in her black and white room can't have had a complete and final theory of color experiences and physicalism is false. Okay, so lots of good responses to this argument I'm going to be exploring, but make sure if you're discussing it in an essay, you present the argument correctly. Uh, not just the gist, but the details. Um, so what is this? So, so the basic idea, according to Frank Jackson, when he was in his dualist phase presenting this argument, he thought there is this, this feature of reality that you can't learn about from neuroscience, from physical science, and is therefore non-physical. What is that feature of reality? <clears throat> it is namely the qualitative character of experience, of color experiences in this case, but then he would generalize out to the, the, quality, the qualities we find in pain experiences or pleasure experiences or any kind of feeling or experience. Jackson thought these qualities are, are non-physical because they go beyond what physical science talks about. Now, Jackson wasn't um, a substance dualist in the sense of Descartes. He thought there were just bodies and brains. He didn't believe in a non-physical soul or substance, but he thought some physical entities, particular in particular brains, as well as their physical properties, the kind of neurophysiological properties physical science deals with and patterns of neural firings and so on, physical science, uh, sorry, sorry, brains also have these non-physical qualities or qualia, the qualities we, we encounter in color experiences or any kind of feelings and experiences. And it's these he thinks Mary learns about or, or the color versions of those when she leaves her black and white room. It's those that physical science couldn't teach us about and, um, and that Mary learns about. Okay. Right. Well, I'll leave the knowledge argument there for now. Um, uh, well, some comments coming up here that may preempt where we're going to go with this. Uh, but for this week, I think I'll just, uh, for the moment, plod on with the lecture. So... Let's move on to the zombie argument. Um, so, first things first, right? Important to start off with how we're defining words. Zombie is a technical term in philosophy. We're not talking about uh, Hollywood zombies. We're talking about philosophical zombies, which are defined differently. So Hollywood zombies, as we all know, look like this and this and this. Whereas philosophical zombies look like this and this and this. In other words, they look just like you or I. Not only do they look like 
ordinary people, but they walk and talk and behave in all ways just like ordinary people. And the reason they do is because the physical workings of their bodies and their brains are just like that of a normal human being, of a real human being. But there's a crucial difference. A zombie is not conscious. There's nothing that it's like to be a zombie. So you stick a knife in a zombie, they'll scream and run away, but they don't actually feel pain. If a zombie's crossing the road, they'll stop, look carefully both ways, carefully cross the road, but they don't actually have any visual or auditory experience of the world around them. The lights are on, but nobody's home. Okay, so the definition of a physical of, of a philosophical zombie is it's a physical duplicate of a human being, but which has no conscious feelings or experiences. Now, you might think, why are we talking about this nonsense? First thing to note is nobody thinks zombies are real. Like right? that's not the point of. Actually, I think there is one philosopher who thinks everyone is a zombie, but them. Somebody was another philosopher was pressing this these arguments on me in a bar recently that try to show that we should all think everyone else is zombies and not just the skeptical arguments but anyway in general philosophers aren't saying these things really exist in the first instance the interest is that they seem to be logically possible in the sense that there's no contradiction or incoherence in the idea of a philosophical zombie so the word that's often used here in the literature is conceivability. I hate that word because it always makes everyone think of it's just about what, what you can imagine. And that might be tied, you know, to contingent facts about human psychology. But that's not really what 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 is what is what we're after here. It's it's more a notion of logical coherence. What you could what couldn't be ruled out just through reasoning a priori. Um, so I, I prefer to use the word logical possibility, although you need to be aware the word conceivability is used a lot in, in the literature. I mean, of course, there, are, there, there may be slightly different definitions of logical possibility. Maybe Sarah Uckelman teaching logic would pull me up on this. Sometimes it's used to mean something a little bit more um, narrow, what can be ruled out in a sort of formal logical system. I'm using it a bit broader than that just to mean what can be ruled out through reasoning. Um, so really what we're thinking of is, so contrast flying pigs and square circles. Neither of these things exist. Um, but flying pigs have a slight advantage in that they, th there's no contradiction or incoherence in the idea of a flying pig. You can't rule out a flying pig just through reasoning, sitting in your armchair. You have to go out and look at the world to know there are no flying pigs, at least on our planet. In contrast, square circles are just logically incoherent. The very idea involves a contradiction. And so you can know just by sitting in your armchair, startling fact, as I discuss in Galileo's era, you can know that nowhere in the whole universe, all of space and time, are there any square circles because they're just flatly incoherent. Crucially, also, we're talking not about um, what, at first glance, you might be able to rule out, but what could be ruled out in principle by a perfect reasoner as it were. So David Chalmers distinguishes prima facie conceivability from ideal conceivability. So prima facie conceivability is what you can rule out very quickly. Maybe square circles are a bit like this, two plus two being five. But uh, maybe time travel is prima facie conceivability or, or time travel involving changing the past. Many philosophers think time travel stories that involve changing the past at least unless you have hyper time or parallel universes or something, these are contradictory. And yet they, you know, they seem to make sense at first. We can watch Back to the Future where Marty McFly changes the past. Kind of seems to make sense. Um, but many philosophers would say, when you really think about it, 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 it turns out to be contradictory. 
really what we're interested in is ideal conceivability. What you think unlimited reasoning could rule out. Maybe you think there's something dodgy about the notion of ideal, thinking about the ideal reasoner when there are no such beings. Uh, you could look at David Chalmers' long paper, Does Conceivability Entail Possibility? But in any case, that's what we're after. We're thinking, are zombies more like flying pigs or more like square circles? Are they the kind of thing you can rule out just by reasoning because they have some kind of subtle or unsubtle contradiction? All right. So building on this and just further clarifying this, it's important to distinguish different kinds of possibility. Uh, one important distinction is between logical and nomological possibility. As I said earlier, nomological means to do with the laws of nature. So nomological possibility is what we can rule out, is what is inconsistent. Sorry, well, if we're talking about possibility, what is consistent with the laws of nature? So maybe, maybe, maybe um, flying pigs are nomologically impossible because because of, of the strength of gravity in our universe because of the mass of pigs maybe flying pigs are impossible um you know that's disputable i'm not i'm just sort of trying to illustrate the point um but certainly it would seem that they're logically possible in this more general sense that there's no contradiction and so in another possible universe if if the laws of nature have been different it seems there could have been flying pigs Maybe traveling faster than light is nomologically impossible, perhaps. Not, not obvious. Some people think there could be tachyons, these hypothetical particles that travel faster than light. light. But maybe some physicists think it's nomologically impossible. The laws of nature don't allow it. But it seems to be logically possible. There are non-contradictory universes, it seems, that uh, have faster than light travel. All of this, I'm sure, can be disputed, but I hope you get the, the idea here. So this is an important distinction. In Galileo's era, I, I suggest that the neuroscientist Anil Seth, who I've uh, debated a few times, um, you can find on YouTube. Um, we debated in, we did the, the, the last year's annual Royal Institute of Philosophy debate with two other philosophers. Um, I suggest that he, in his discussion of zombies, he mixes up logical and nomological possibility. You can have a look at that because, so David Chalmers is the perhaps well-known and influential defender of the possibility of zombies, but he, he doesn't think they're nomologically possible. And that's because David Chalmers believes in what he calls psychophysical laws of nature. He thinks that in our universe, there are these special fundamental laws of nature over and above the laws of physics that ensure that certain physical states produce consciousness. So Chalmers thinks if we were in a purely physical world, if physicalism were true, if there was just matter and the laws of physics, then we'd all be zombies. There wouldn't be any consciousness. But fortunately, thinks Chalmers, there are all these extra laws of nature in our universe that bridge the gap to consciousness and that ensure that when you get certain specific neurophysiological happenings in brains, psh, consciousness pops up. And he thinks it's a, it's a task of science, partly through doing neuroscience to try and work out what the, what the psychophysical laws are. So although Chalmers is a dualist, he calls himself a, a psycho, sorry, a naturalistic dualist in that he thinks consciousness is not physical, but he hopes we can expand the project of science and bring non-physical consciousness into the story of science, understand non-physical consciousness as a law-governed phenomenon. So we can relate this back to what Frank Jackson believed in his dualist days. Uh, these non-physical properties that um, he thinks brains have that Murray encounters when she leaves her room. I mean, she knew some of them already, but the, the, the color ones that she didn't know about, she couldn't work out from neuroscience that she encountered. You might have wondered, well, where did they pop up from? Well, Chalmers would explain that in terms of the psychophysical laws. It's because of the psychophysical laws that brains develop these non-physical properties. Okay. Um, all right. 
So this is the first question. Are zombies um, logically possible? Now, a lot of people have the initial reaction. I said they're just ridiculous. They're absurd. Of course, they're not possible. They just seem absurd. Might be worth noting, um, just as a matter of sociological fact, 60% of Anglophone philosophers in the recent 2020 Phil Papers survey on the consciousness question, 60% thought they think that zombies are logically possible. Uh, quite a consensus among philosophers who normally disagree on everything. Only about 16.4%, I think, think zombies are logically impossible, inconceivable. Um, now, this is not a popularity contest, and you're very welcome. Many good philosophers do think zombies are logically impossible, uh, and you're welcome to defend that. But it might at least give one a little bit of pause for thought if 60% of the relevant experts who've sort of read all the literature, had their views scrutinized by peer review and in talks and so on, um, have reached that view. Okay, but what I do in Galileo's Error, I try to give a little argument for the logical possibility of zombies, and we'll briefly consider that now. And this argument is rooted in the problem of other minds. This sceptical worry that it seems whatever empirical information we could learn about another human being or another animal, it wouldn't prove that they were conscious in the sense of logically demonstrating it. Right? If you think about everything you could learn about my brain and all the electrochemical signaling and so on, it doesn't seem that any of that proves that I have feelings and experiences. All of that seems consistent with the absence of feelings and experiences and the possibility that I'm just a complicated, unfeeling mechanism. Um, this is This relates to challenges in thinking about animal ethics. We used to think fish were not conscious. Most That used to be the majority opinion. I think it's now the majority opinion that they are conscious, but it's very hard. It's hard to see what we could learn about the workings of the bodies and brains of fish that would conclusively demonstrate whether or not they have feelings and ex subjective experiences. Um, now, I'm not saying there aren't ways to rationally proceed here. I guess we... If it's a human being, you can ask them what they're feeling. You can scan their brain. Uh, you can try and correlate in that way conscious experiences with brain activity, and you can extrapolate to the uh, non-human case. My point is here just that arguably, you may disagree with this, but on the face of it, it seems that um, not nothing we could learn empirically would logically demonstrate, and in that strong sense, prove that um, that the person has feelings and experiences. You might say, okay, well, why am I why am I working with this very this? That seems a very strong demand. Logically demonstrating it, not many things are logically demonstrated. Well, the point is, in this context, it seems that if zombies were logically impossible, it would seem you could demonstrate that others were not zombies because you could um you could there would be certain empirical facts about the human that would logically entail that they have consciousness okay so so it seems and here's the premise one here if zombies were logically impossible it would be able to prove that you're not a zombie if you share the intuition and you may not that you can't ever conclusively prove that someone else is not a zombie that then it does seem to that we can infer that zombies are logically impossible. Okay, well, there's a quick argument you can consider. Um, okay, but you may still be thinking, all right, zombies are... Who cares? Maybe zombies are logically possible. Loads of things are logically possible. Flying pigs, golden mountains, whatever. Me being king of the universe. Who cares what's logically possible? We should be interested in the real world. Well, one way of, you know, how how you might how could this mere logical possibility rule out um, a popular scientific, a popular philosophical option such as physicalism? Well, one way of trying to work this mere logical possibility, if it is a logical possibility, into an argument against physicalism appeals to 
what we can call the identity principle. This principle that if X and Y are identical, then it is logically impossible for X to exist without Y or vice versa. It's maybe important to clarify what we're meaning by logical possibility here. No, sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that. It may be important to clarify what we're meaning by identity here. What we're meaning is what is sometimes more specifically called numerical identity, where X and Y are one and the same thing. So take the example of Superman and Clark Kent. Superman is identical to Clark Kent in the sense that there aren't two people. There's just one person with two labels, one person that sometimes flies around with a cape and sometimes wears glasses and works as a reporter for the Daily Planet. But that's just the same person, right? Unbeknownst to many people, but that's the reality. So because it's just one person, um, well, anyway, maybe we'll get onto that. So this contrasts with, for example, qualitative identity. In, for example, when you have, when we talk of identical twins, it's not that Bill and Ben, the identical twins, are the same person. It's just that they're perfectly resembling. Of course, they're never perfectly resembling. We could imagine clones. Or we to get more sci-fi, you could have um, you know, mirror universes where everything on one side of the universe perfectly mirrors what happens on the other side of the universe. Uh, so then you would have perfect resemblance or qualitative identity, perhaps. But that's different to numerical identity, where you've just no, it's just one person with two labels or water being Id identical with H2O, right? It's not that like I've got a bottle of water here. It's not like there's the water in the glass and the H2O. No, water just is H2O. One, There's one kind of stuff with two names. One is the sort of the everyday name for it and one is the more scientifically revealing name, but it's just two terms for the same thing. So the thought behind the identity principle is, well, look, in these cases, where you've just got one thing with two labels, well, obviously X and Y couldn't exist independently. Not even God could tear apart Clark Kent from Superman because Clark Kent just is Superman. There are two people to tear apart. Now, there are possible universes where um, that one person doesn't fly around with a cape. There are possible universes where that one person doesn't wear glasses and work for the Daily Planet. But that's that's not, arguably, that's not a possible world where Clark Kent isn't Superman, because Clark Kent just is Superman. That's a possible world where this one person, who we refer to in these two ways, behaves differently, has different properties. Similarly, not even God, you might think, could tear apart the water in this bottle from the H2O, because water just is H2O. Um, there aren't two things to tear apart. Um, there's no possible universe where water exists without H2O. So this is the thought. If X and Y are identical, then it's logically imp impossible for one to exist without the other. And with this in place, we get to the formulation of the zombie argument. Slightly simplified. We'll get more into the details next week that I present. But this is the certainly simplified present uh, that I present. <laughs> Simplified form I present in Galileo's error. Um, so, actually, what I don't say in Galileo's error is that, again, I'm not tr trying not to overcomplicate for uh, a general audience, but I'm actually just talking about what we've come to know as reductive physicalism that involves a specific identity between feelings and brain states. So let's make that implicit assumption um me let's make that explicit assumption implicit ex assumption explicit now and here's the argument so if reductive physicalism is true then feelings are identical with brain states if feelings are identical with brain states then it's not logically possible for feelings to exist without brain states or vice versa that's follows from the identity principle um if zombies are logically possible, then it is logically possible for brain states to exist without without feelings. By definition of a zombie, that's just what a zombie is. Um, a zombie has all of the brain states a human being has, but none of the feelings. Right? That's just what a zombie is. So when, a, when you stick a knife in a zombie, it has the brain states a human has when they feel pain, but it doesn't actually feel pain. Therefore, if zombies are logically possible, so sorry, is that logically possible, physicalism is false. 
Zombies are logically possible. We could support that with the earlier slide. Therefore, reductive physicalism is false. Okay, so this is just an argument against reductive physicalism. We can... Um, Digital gnosis is uh, really, again, some people in the comments, in the same way I can conceive of brains not being phenomenal states epistemically. Similarly, I can do the same thing with water and H2O. My imagination is not a guide to anything useful. Well, this perhaps preempts uh, the, the deeper discussion of this we're going to get into next week. Um, um, also, well, just a slight qualification on that. Again, this is not about imagination, right? This is maybe we're misled by this word conceivability. What we're talking about here is not what human beings can imagine, but what any possible reason, ideal reasoners, the perfect reasoners could rule out just through reasoning. Uh, so that's not limited to contingent human psychology. Now, you might well think this is a dodgy notion of the ideal reasoner. That's something one could pursue, but just to be clear about that. But yes, there are um, ways we could uh, further challenge and lead into a, a, a more nuanced form of this argument. But, um, okay, we'll just, I'll make one, one, one more point here. So as I said, this is aimed only at reductive physicalism, but actually it's quite easy to expand it, I think, to more general forms of physicalism. So what about non-reductive physicalists who think mental properties are not specifically identical with specific neurophysiological properties, but are just are dependent on physical properties, are dependent on what's going on in my brain? Well, whilst non-reductive physicalists don't identif identify mental properties with physical properties, specific neurophysiological properties, most of them I, I would say perhaps all of them in my, almost all of them, at least in my experience, you may find some exceptions, do identify mental properties with functional properties of some kind. What are functional properties? Okay, very important word, functional here. Functional properties are, are properties that are defined in terms of behavior, both external behavior, sensory inputs and behavioral outputs, but also internal behavior, uh, behavior of the parts inside of the brain. And behavioral dispositions, how things are disposed to behave. Um, we might say, for example, that the, the vase is disposed is fragile in the sense that it's disposed to break, uh, even if it never breaks in its whole existence. We can still talk about how it's disposed to behave. So, I mean, his historically, um, people started off thinking about behaviorism. If we could define mental states just in terms of outwards behavior, inputs and outputs. Uh, defining pain in terms of, you know, getting stabbed and screaming. People quickly realize that that's too simplistic. We need we, we need to talk about internal behavior as well as external behavior and about behavioral dispositions, dispositions to behave as well as just actual behavior. But still, and this leads to the position known as functionalism rather than behaviorism, which is still trying to define mental states purely in behavioral terms, but it's this more nuanced sense of behavior, both internal and external, both dispositional as well as explicit actual behavior. Um, so most physicalists um, who are not reductive physicalists are functionalists in some very general sense. So we can simply say, um, so we, even if they don't identify, so non-reductives are not going to identify mental states with physical states, but they are likely to identify them with functional properties. And therefore, we can just slightly modify the argument so that it's aimed at physicalism more generally. If physicalism is true, then feelings are ident... Sorry, that should be are identical, not and identical. Are identical with brain states or functional properties. If feelings are identical with brain states, sorry, that should say or functional properties slash functional properties, then it's not logically possible for feelings to exist without brain states slash functional properties or vice versa. Again, follows from the uh, identity principle. Uh, if zombies are logically possible, then it's logically, sorry, if zombies log then it's logically possible for brain states slash functional properties to exist without feelings. Therefore, if zombies are logically possible, physicalism is false. Uh, zombies are logically possible. Therefore, physicalism is false. Okay. So that's the initial introduction to the argument. Next week, um, we will delve 
more deeply into um, challenges to this argument, which leads to the more nuanced form that you actually find in the academic literature, defended, for example, by me in Consciousness of Fundamental Reality or David Chalmers, for example, in his paper, The Two-Dimensional Argument Against Materialism, and of course, the responses that contemporary physicalists give to that. But hopefully that should be enough to uh, get you going on discussing your initial thoughts on these arguments. And I will arrange for some time to interact on this next week. Um, also, if you are subscribed, premium subscribers to the channel, to the Mind Chat community, uh, there will be a dis hour some point to discuss this um, or anything else later this month. I'm in discussion with those people. Um, thank you for listening. Whoever you are, maybe students and subscribers would like to interact in the comments. Please be polite. Um, I wonder how this will go. This You can all praise me in the feedback for my pioneering teaching methods. Okay. Um, well, I'll leave it there for now. And I will see you in person next week. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. How do I stop this?